Hi, everybody, and welcome back to SOC 101, or everything you wanted to know about a computer but were afraid to ask. And now we're going to move on to the lecture called Communicating with Peripherals, or How to Build a Router. This lecture is heavily based on the wonderful lecture called Interfaces, External, Internal, or Why CPUs Suck. The lecture was written by Tzachi Noy, a former student of mine, and given back in 2019. And I loved the lecture so much, I decided to turn it into one of the lectures that I give in my course. So, what do a car and a router have in common? Well, they both have a CPU inside. Let's see, let's look at the car and the router. Both of them have interfaces. In a car, you have all kinds of sensors to, to make it become a car. You know, it has to have, especially if it's an autonomous and a smart car. And then these sensors, they um, get all kinds of information. They go to all kinds of different computation units that uh, do all kinds of calculations and signal processing and so forth on them, make decisions, and then give these uh, decisions to all kinds of actuators, such as the steering wheel, to make it, say, uh, keep your lane or turn or whatever. Um, a router is no different than that. A router is another type of an embedded system. The router has, you know, these cables that uh, connect us to the internet. Um, they get all kinds of data that comes in. They go and they process it. They decide what to do and they send it out through a, a cable that goes out. So both of these things go through interfaces. One of the types of interfaces on the car is, you know, things like sensors and so forth that bring uh, data in and all kinds of actuators and so forth that take data out. The other type is just like communication that can transmit or receive um, on the input and transmit and receive on the output. So in this lecture, we're going to be looking at, with our embedded system, with our SOC, at this part that uh, includes the, the buses, you know, the primary and secondary bus that we looked at last lecture, and these different types of peripherals that go around that enable us to connect to the outside world. And actually, what we're going to do is we're going to design a router as an example to introduce these concepts. So the router is going to be this simple example that's kind of kind of go with us throughout the lecture. And we're going to see as we build up the router how we're going to get from, you know, the stuff that we've learned until now to the whole picture of how we design an entire system. So here's the lecture outline. And we're going to start with a chapter that I call Communicating with the Outside World. So what do we have up till now? I guess we could look at it in this way. We have our CPU, you know, that is uh, the basic, you know, machine that can do everything, our Turing machine that we can write programs to and they can run them. We have some sort of a bus. We may have several buses and so forth, some sort of an interconnect. And we have memory, of course, that helps us store our state and do uh, types of things. Um, and is that uh, enough to make our, um, you know, to make a router? Well, the answer is no, because again, we have those interfaces that we want to go and communicate with the outside world. And therefore, we need to um, do that somehow. Well, we already saw that the CPU sees the whole world um, just as a bunch of memory. So in order to communicate with the outside world, we have to add some IO, that is memory mapped. And let's do that by adding some uh, pins, which we call general purpose IO or GPIO pins, which can do everything. And really, every type of system on chip or um, almost every type of chip that you're going to find is going to have a set of 8 or 32 or maybe even more of the general purpose types of IO pins. And um, what can these IO pins do? They can just connect to anything. It's just a driver or an input-output type of a, uh, of a circuit that can connect to different things. The GPIOs will have some sort of a flip-flop and some sort of buffer um, that give us both the option to be an output and the option to be an input. And for example, we can connect an output to a LED, for example, and then we can cause this LED to turn on or turn off. And we can connect the input to a button or something like that, which can cause us to see if there's a one or a zero um, that has been input by the user on the button. So really, by adding these uh, GPIOs to our bus, we can really have this whole system that can now interface to the outside world, and we can um, start to do our communication. Well, let's just look at um, some of the, what we just said. I'm going to remind you of what we discussed before about memory mapped I.O. So registers and I.O. devices are given an address in the system's memory map. In other words, one of these big ideas in, in computing in general is that everything in the world is just treated the same as a memory. To communicate it I.O. with I.O., we're going to write and read from the address that was given to the I.O. And the I.O. knows that we're talking to it, and then it can take whatever data we wrote to the I.O. and do whatever its command is supposed to be, such as turn on the LED or turn off the LED or so forth. Um, so how do we do these? We use simple load and store assembly commands. Um, what we're going to do is go up a level into C, and we can define something like these two functions that can easily do that. We'll use a peak function to see what is at our I.O. and a poke function to um, you know, change the state of our I.O. So we can write a, a function like this, that um, peak gets some sort 
sort of pointer to a memory location that we define, and it's going to return the value that is pointed to at that location. And a poke function is going to take both that location and a new value, some sort of a byte or something like that, to write over to there. And then we can um, write to that location the value that we wanted to put. So peek is going to read what we have at the memory mapped address, and poke is going to um, uh, and poke is going to put a new value at that address. Now we can, to access a register, we just define its address. So we use a define command. Uh, we give some address to the device. And then we can look at what the status is by doing something like this. You know, the, some uh, variable is going to be peak what's at that device address. And um, to change the value, we can poke to that device address. So what are those general purpose IOs that we discussed before? Going deeper into them, we can see that this is a general schematic of a general purpose IO. And here is what we would have in the real system. This is taken from a manual of a Raspberry Pi. So you can see it's a bit more complicated than our, than our simple um, drawing. But really, what a, a GPIO is, it's basically an input-output buffer. So we have a, a, a tri-state output buffer with an output enable on it, and we have an input buffer. And what the tri-state output buffer is going to do, it's going to take some sort of um, data that is sampled at some register, and this register is going to be memory mapped, so it's going to have some value. So if I write to this value, I'm going to store a 1 or a 0 inside this flip-flop, and it's going to be driven to this output buffer. The output buffer has a level shifter to take us from the on-chip uh, voltages to the external voltages, but it also has this output enable. It's usually uh, um, a low enable. Uh, it's, a, it's a negative um, enabled output enable. So when we put a 0 over here, this is going to become an output. Um, so we have another uh, register, which is the GPIO config register. If we put a zero in it, it's going to turn on this output buffer, and we are, we are going to push whatever is stored in this uh, in this uh, flip flop out to the external pin. If we put a one inside the GPIO register, it's going to turn off this output buffer. We're going to have a high Z over here, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take whatever value is pushed from external onto this onto this um, signal over here, and it's going to be um, driven through an I/O buffer from the I/O voltage down to the digital voltage um, into this uh, input register, and that is going to be sampled at the input register. Again, this is going to be memory mapped, so we can just go and read it. As you can see, um, the in the equivalent circuit for the Raspberry Pi, we have some other things, like we have these uh, diodes, which are going to protect us from ESD, and we're going to have some pull-up and pull-down circuitry, which is going to give us a default value of a 0 over 1 if nothing is connected here. So if we take a, a chip and we don't connect the pin to any um, to any voltage on the board, then we're going to, according to what we put in, in this pull-up and pull-down uh, register, we're either going to have a 1 or a 0 constantly on this thing. We can also use these things for bootstrapping to get an initial value when we start. Um, the output also may go through some sort of a hysteresis or something like that to, to give us some noise protection. So really, a, a GPIO, a general purpose IO, can be configured to be an input or an output, depending on you know the uh, programming of these registers that we get here. We program this as a zero, it's going to be an output. If we program it as a one, it's going to be an input, of course. Um, it must be. It must get from the external connection to the board the right type. If we try to drive something when this is uh, when the output is enabled, we'll have a conflict over here, and that will not be good. Um, so uh, we can configure the I/O register, um, you know, at the beginning of our uh, boot up, and then we can go and uh, poke or peek um, from the to the output or from the input to see what we have over there. So let's see how we would use such a GPIO for doing you know, the basic hello world of an embedded system, which is blinking a LED. So here we have our um, GPIO uh, pin, and we're going to have, again, several of these in the board, maybe uh, 30 uh, in our chip, maybe 32 of them or something like that. Um, each one of them is going to have a specific uh, address, a specific bit probably in a, in a, in a word, uh, you know, in a location. And then uh, we're going to have our LED that we're going to put over here. And once we get a high voltage here of VDD, then and that's going to uh, cause current through the um, diode over here and turn on the LED. When we get a low voltage here, the LED is going to go off. So how are we going to do that? In our C code, we're going to first configure the GPIO to be an output. So we're going to define you know, uh, names for each of these memory mapped addresses. So the GPIO config reg, the GPIO output reg, um, and the GPIO blink pin. Um, 
and blink period. These are things that we uh, really um, decided on. Actually, here we only um, state this register for the output and this register for the config because we're not um, really looking at uh, the the input over here. So um, now, what do we do? We're going to uh, put this uh, temporary variable called toggle config, which is going to or with uh, peak. GPI or reg, uh, config reg. So that's going to see what the status of, of, our, uh, our, of our GPI or reg is. And then we're going to poke the GPI or reg to toggle config. So um, what, what that means is that we're going to set actually the, uh, the register over here to become an output. OK, so we put a 0 over here. It's going to turn on this as a, it's going to configure it as an output. And now what we're going to do is we're going to set an infinite loop. We have lots of infinite loops in our embedded system, so we have while true. What we're going to do is we're going to toggle the state of the GAPI output register. So we're going to look at the status of the output register by peeking at it. We're going to read what this register is. And then we're going to poke to it. We're going to write to it the, uh, the, the, the um, opposite of that. So we're going to negate whatever is in there. And so that's going to toggle the output status. And since this is a, uh, uh, an infinite loop, what we're going to do now is wait for some sort of period that we defined before here. And then every, uh, one, uh, every whatever our period we put over here, it's going to change the status of, the, of, of this to be 1 to 0. And it's going to turn on and turn off the LED. So that is how we blink a LED. So what if we want to communicate with something more sophisticated than a letter or a button? Because I don't think we're going to be able to go out and use this type of a GPIO in order to go and make our router. We really need a communication protocol. So let's look at the most simple kind of uh, standard communication protocol that we find on every system. And it's called UART, the Universal Asynchronous Receiver and Transmitter. And this is really a very simple type of a communication protocol where um, one device talks to the other through a, um, a unidirectional uh, bus over here, or actually signal. It's a single signal. And if the other device wants to, um, to reply, it also has a unidirectional signal. So we have this transmit and this receive type of um, signals that come uh, in and out of our device. Okay, and this is a very slow and very simple serial protocol. So what we have here is in our package, we have a start bit. We have data bits, which are going to be a byte long. Sometimes they'll be longer in order to have some sort of uh, uh, additional data in there. And then we're going to have parity bits and stop bits. So what the start bit is, it means that we're, in, in general, we're going to hold our transmission always on a pull-up. So it's always going to show a 1. Once we want to start a transmission, our transmitter is going to pull it down for 1 uh, one period, one cycle, and then it's going to start transmitting our eight bits, um, you know, our whole byte of data, and they're going to be transmitted one after the other, one zero, one zero, one one one, whatever, um, until we finish our, our last bit, and then we're going to pull it up again for at least one cycle to um, show that we have a stop bit. So that's a really, really um, slow kind of way that we're going to push bit after bit. You see that there's no clock here. So how do we actually know what the uh, difference between each bit is and so forth? And how, how is our CPU going to actually go and see that uh, there was a change in the bits over here? Well, we have something called the baud rate. And the baud rate is 1 over the bit time. And baud rates are very slow in, in UART in general. And they have to be negotiated ahead of time so both the transmitter and the receiver know what the baud rate is. And then the CPU can over clock and see when uh, we have a change or we don't have a change in the bits that were, you know, first of all, to recognize the start bit and then see when we have a change in the data that's going through. Um, therefore, we also can uh, calculate the bandwidth of this. And the bandwidth is actually the data that we have per unit time. So it's not that we have at every unit time, you know, we send one byte, but we actually have a frame that's longer than a byte. It has at least a start bit and a stop bit. So it's going to be at least 10 bits. So our bandwidth is going to be the number of data bits, which in this case is 8 divided by the number of frame width, uh, bits, which is going to be at least 10, and um, times our baud rate. So that's our actual bandwidth. So it's going to be lower than the baud rate. So we're really very, really slow. Um, this uh, UART protocol was developed in the 60s. It has really high voltages, something like minus 15 volts to 15 volts. Um, we used to have a serial port that would do this. Um, uh, but nowadays, we usually do it through something like a USB that talks to the UART. Anyway, UARTs are on every real, really every system, and it's a good way to try and hack different types of systems. But that's the, the thing that you're going to want to start debugging your system when you get your chip back from the manufacturer and it doesn't work. So can we use UART for our router? Well, let's start doing some math over here. So the baud rate, the fastest baud rate that UART really um, supports is 115 uh, kilobit per second. Okay, so 115, 200 bits per second. 
the sample rate has to be, according to Nyquist, at least double that in order for us to know that we can actually um, see where we have changes in our, in our uh, input over there. So we're going to have our, our, our sample rate as double our baud rate, at least. If uh, the code for you know, doing one sample for reading one bit um, that comes from the UART is about 40 instructions, and that's uh, just kind of a, a low-balling it of how much it would actually cost me to go through you know, our, our data bus, our AMBA bus, or whatever we have to go and uh, do such a peek and see what we have inside our, um, inside our UART. So the overhead is going to be you know, 230,400 samples per second, 40 instructions per sample. It's going to be 9 million instructions per second. So the question is, is that good? And if we have 100 megahertz, you know, clock frequency, which is something kind of, uh, you know, on the low figure, but we also um, took low numbers over here. Um, but it's also an okay kind of embedded system, you know. That means that 9.2% of our CPU time is just going to be um, spent on going and peeking at the UART or looking at the UART and dealing with the UART. Is that good? Probably not. You know, we want to make a, a communication that's much faster than this 115 k bit per second. And the CPU has to do other things other than just dealing with, you know, one UART. There may be several of them as well. So taking 10% of our time, you know, just for uh, peeking at the UART, that's probably not a good thing. And we'll probably have to go and do something else.